Hello and welcome back to the channel. You're joining me today as we follow the progress of the manufacture of this curved wall unit. I've done a couple of videos on the curved base unit that sits below this wall unit. The purpose of this video is to not only follow the progress of manufacturing this through, but also there's a few things that I did differently in the manufacturing of this curved unit that I did on the base units. A couple of things I learned from experience and some techniques that I'd like to pass on. Along with there's a couple of details on here that the base unit didn't have. There is under cabinet lighting, there's lighting in the top unit, and there's also lighting behind the doors. So when you open the doors, the lights come on. And there's that open top unit as well with pippy oak veneered back. So that's a little bit different, as well as there being a cornice that's scribed to the ceiling. So there's a few things going on here that are different. So I thought it was worthwhile to make a third video for this little mini series. Now I'd just like to remind you that the detail on this cabinetry is that the frames have a bevel on them and then the doors sit back 5mm from the frame so it makes it a little bit tricky with this curved unit in that you have to make a former that accommodates the different radius on the door to the frame. So straight into the workshop at the start of the project, I'm using the form here to make the curved rails for the frame and the doors. Now the frame rails need to be a greater radius than that of the doors. So I'm using a four mil packer underneath the laminations just to increase that radius up by the amount the bevel sits the doors back from the frame. One thing I did differently at this stage was to use a backing board on top of the laminations so that the vacuum pressure of the bag wasn't on the outer lamination of timber. It actually had a backing board on top of them laminations and it helped to spread the pressure of the bag evenly across them pieces of timber. And they ended up with a much smoother rail than when I just put them straight into the bag. Another thing worth noting that a couple of viewers commented from the previous videos is that the use of a slotted baseboard in the bag when you push the former in really helps to slide that form in without catching on the bag and it also helps to transfer the air across to the former really quickly so the air is evacuated from the bag a lot smoother alongside not damaging the bag as you slide the form in. So you're not actually at any point sliding the former across the bag surface, it's on top of that fixed board that's already inside. So once they were glued up, I made another former, this time for the outside radius of the cabinet. And I used that so that I could machine the rails in the tenoner and also cut them off to length. So I used it here on the cross cut and I marked a repeat cut line on that form. So when I'm holding them on the crosscut saw, I cut all the rails off at exactly the same length from that line. And then that meant when I tenoned them and pushed them up to the stop in the tenoner, they all came out exactly the same size. So that's the door rails machined and it's pretty much exactly the same process for the frame rails. The next main components for the cabinet face frame are the vertical sections, so the styles and the jams. In the previous videos I glued these up from some laminations on the former, much the same as the rails, but I found that the outer surface of the upright, so as they stretched along that former, the outer surface was quite varying in thickness, whereas the inner surface was perfect because it sat actually physically on the former. And it's the outer surface of them uprights that is actually the bit that you see on the outside of the cabinet. So I wasn't very happy that that was a little bit inconsistent. I managed to sand it out on the original frames, but I looked for a better solution. And that came in the form of getting some cutters made up from Paul at Cutter Profilers. He machined me a internal and external radius cutter so I could actually machine the upright sections from a straight and square piece of timber so that I got them absolutely perfectly straight and even in thickness. So there's a teeny, teeny bit of snipe on some of these where I've caught the end a little bit more. Well, it's not really snipe. That's more of a setup issue. But I just adjusted it after I did two of them and I managed to get rid of that little line in there. But that, it's quarter of a millimetre of that, so 
shouldn't take much sanding out, but it's a lot more accurate than having them styles that I'd glued up because they were, well, you were, like I say, relying on the thickness of each layer over 12 different pieces being formed around a mould that you've made, whereas this, you know, is dead straight and dead true. Uh, through that cut, it'll be the same thickness all the way through the rail, so that's worked really well. And it's also an awful lot quicker. I've used a lot less wood, so I've, I've managed to get it out of a piece of wood that was, what, three mil thicker than the finished size? Whereas to get 12 laminations out to make a thing that size, you're using nearly three times the amount of wood to, to be able to bandsaw, plane, sand, and then uh, glue them together to make that thickness. So a lot more efficient in terms of wood and time, and it's also more accurate. So that's a bit of a thumbs up on that one, I think, from me. Once the inside and outside curves were machined, I then used a, like a square cut rebate block to put the appropriate bevel on the edges of the bits of wood. And I had to leave just a little flat on the piece of timber so that as I ran it through the machine, it didn't tip into the cutter block at the ends of the cut. And then that little flat was just removed with a hand plane. I covered all the setting up of the joints and the mortising up the uprights in great detail in the other videos. So I'm just going to show you a test fit in the panel here and the rail for one of the doors. It's really satisfying to spend all that time making these components and then finally see it come together. Now when I assembled the frame this time around I made life an awful lot easier for myself. Rather than rigging up an elaborate folding wedge setup to clamp the frame joints like I did in the first videos, I simply drilled through the outside of the rails or the jams of the frame and into the rails and pulled them together with a wood screw and used a washer on the outside to exert the pressure of the screw on the outside of the rail and pull it all together. So it pulled the joints really nice and tight and it was absolutely the, the easiest method of assembling that frame. It also meant that the frame was free to sit on the former, so I could check that it was sitting square, not twisting, and, and was correct as it was drying with the glue. Whereas before where I'd wedged it, there was no excess tension in the way I was holding it with the clamps and the wedges. I was hoping that when I undid the clamps that it didn't spring out of place, so this was a much better method for assembling the frame. Again, I'm using a formal packer on the former, for this frame section just to keep the radius correct between the frame and the door. And also got that square board inside, making sure that the opening where the doors are is nice and square. Now moving on to that top cabinet section, the panels on this were to match the rest of the exposed oak in the kitchen, which is some pippy English oak. I happen to have this one particularly nice bit left over. It had almost like a burr end to the slab. So I tried my best to use as much of this as possible. It's a little bit tricky as the slab is fairly plain, but then there was this huge lump of burr or character at one end. So I was, I was struggling a little bit to make it look like it would blend in throughout the whole of that top unit rather than just having one lump of character than a plain cabinet, but I think I've managed it. To make the veneers, I planed one face just to flatten it then cut the veneers through on the band saw in a deep rip cut. These were about seven mil thick off the saw. I think I managed to cut four thicknesses from each piece of wood. It just gave me enough to make the top unit. I then put them in the vac bag and glued them veneers to a piece of birch plywood and then pushed them through the wide belt sander once they were dry to get them all to the exact same thickness. Pretty much the same as the base unit, I use the bandsaw and I've got that curve cutting jig that you can make yourself and it accurately cuts out the curve to the radius of the face frame and that cut is pretty much neat enough to use without doing anything to it. So no sanding or anything, 
and once it's pocket hole screwed it to the frame it really does just give a nice sharp edge so not a lot of work needed there on that curved cut. And then I just cut the back of the unit square on the cross cut along with adding the two back panels to make up the complete oak veneered carcass. After a quick dry assembly of the unit on the bench to test the fit of the doors and the cornice, nice. I took the doors off again and began sanding the joints and prepping for the paint finish. I found cutting a polystyrene block to the curve of the unit really handy for sanding with, but I found I had to cover them with tape before gluing the sandpaper on, as otherwise the glue melted into the polystyrene and it didn't hold. There's a fair amount of hand sanding involved in the curved work, so just be prepared for a few hours of sitting there meaninglessly sanding the same bit of wood. I'm just going to run you through the wiring I've got put in the cabinet to make all the lights work. So there's going to be an under cabinet spotlight, so these are like a slim line pushing, go into the panel that's underneath. So you've just got a long tail on that that can run up to the side of the cabinet. So there's plenty of room for a cable to go from the spotlight to one side, so I've chosen this side here. Then a little notch through, and groove to the edge of the face frame where there's no fixings on this side because the fixings on this side are put in the actual carcass. So they go all the way to the top and the driver's going to sit on the top. So there's going to be a power feed from the lighting in the room. So when they turn the lights on in the room, that's going to power up the driver. From the driver it goes into a 12 volt dimmer and then from the dimmer down to the light. So that light will come on with the lights in the room. It's the same thing for the lights in here. So there's going to be lights in this top cupboard and that's going to sit inside the bottom shelf. So there's a shelf in here. So the shelf drops in here and I've got a couple of LED strips that will sit in up the back there. So I've chopped them in and lighted them around the corner. So they're going to sit in there and again the feed from them comes out in this corner, goes up with that cable and goes into that same dimmer switch so they're both powered on with the lights in the room. Then we've got the lights inside the cabinet as well. So these have got LED strips down the side, they just, just fit in this bit here. So I'll put a little rebate in the shelf strip to give it another millimetre of clearance for the little LED trap to sit in. But just as an example, they sit in like that. Um, like I say, it'll go one mole, one millimetre deeper than that. So you don't really see them from the inside, but it puts a really nice light, sort of accentuating the shelf strip along here all the way up the length of the upright. So that one's a little bit more complicated to wire up because we've got a sensor on that one. So when you open the cupboard door, you get a PIR sensor. Now I offset that ever so slightly. So that's the center line of my cupboard. So the sensor is slightly offset to one side and that's so that it doesn't detect you as you walk past. So you have like a, a one and a half, two mil gap in the center of the doors. And if your sensor is dead in line with that, it can actually pick you up as you walk past the cupboard from the outside with the doors closed. So I'll just very slightly offset that so it doesn't pick you up, but it still grabs you when you open and or reach into the cabinet to grab something, the light sensors kick on and it turns the light on. So the power source for that is a different feed at the top of the cabinet. So there's another feed coming in that will be a permanent live. That permanent live goes to this sensor. So that's on a 240 volt side, that sensor. This cable from the sensor travels up to the top of the cupboard and it's like the switch wire. So it plugs into this and from this, the permanent live comes in and then a switched live then comes out in 240 volt. Then that will travel to a 12 volt LED driver and then from the driver to a dimmer switch again so that we can set the light in perfect so it's not just full on brightness, you get just a nice glow and then from that dimmer switch it goes down to the LED strips. And the LED strips again will be wired top to bottom and then there'll be a little tail on each strip soldered on. That comes out in this cavity that I've left in this center section here. And then I've drilled through from the center section to the outside. Again, where I've got a bit of space. 
come through here and route it up a separate channel. It's not, not complicated, but it definitely requires some thought in how to assemble the cabinet and make all the lighting work with somewhere for it all to go. So there's quite a few drivers, dimmers and boxes to go on top of the unit. Now in order to get to them, service them and maintain them after it's fitted, I've put some little blocks on the cornice. So these are going to have, are going to be replaced. These were just temporary ones while I was fitted, but these are going to be a bit bigger and have a magnet attached to them on the underside. And again, a magnet on the top of the unit. And then I can put that in place or slide it in once that unit is fitted and it will just slide in and, and lock in with the magnets and it should just sit in place nicely. Once that's done, I'd run it through into the spray booth and got everything painted up and the top unit lacquered and then came on to the final assembly of the unit. The internal of the cupboard has the sawtooth adjustable height shelving and the upright piece on here is to hold placemats in the corner of the cupboard. The last part to actually be finished was that magnet detail on the cornice which makes it removable and that actually turned out really well. The magnets give a, a really strong pull when they're that close together. So it sort of snaps into position with quite a decent amount of force. So it should maintain its position. So there we have it then, that's the finished cupboard. Hopefully the video was worth making and you've enjoyed watching it progress. There's just them few bits that were different from the first two videos. And the fact there was a couple of different techniques I used as well. I thought it was worthwhile pointing out the differences in the two and it would no doubt help someone if they're going to be trying a curved cupboard for the first time. I'm sure the, the things that I've learnt doing this will be invaluable to that person. Don't forget to hit the like, comment and subscribe. And there's a little bell next to the subscribe button that will notify you next time I put a video on. So if you just subscribe, it put the video in the subscriptions feed. But if you tap the little bell icon next to the subscribe button, then it'll actually pop you a notification to say there's a new video. So you won't miss any future uploads.